we are in the condition we are in, in the state of ignorance we are in, in the state of war, in the state of economic depression, in the state of depletion of the resources of our planet because of the greed of psychopaths who thought they could create their own reality. Well, look at the reality they created. You're listening to Stop Talk Radio, the world from people who think. Welcome to Shot Talk Radio. I'm Joe Quinn, and my co-hosts this week are Neil Bradley. Hi, everyone. Uh, Laura. And Harrison Curley. Hi there. Did I say your name right, Harrison? How did you say it? Curley? That's the technically precise way to put it. Excellent. <laughs> I like to be technically precise. But uh, I've known him as Keeley. It's a more Irish sounding. It's actually pretty Irish people. Irish people. Well, it doesn't, it's not spelled in an Irish way, so it doesn't get away with that one. Anyway... Um, this week, we are hopefully going to be talking to William Patrick Patterson. Actually, did everybody say hello? Say hello, Laura. Hello. Say hello, Neil. Hello. Did you say hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, this week, we are hopefully going to be talking to William Patrick Patterson. Um, Mr. Patterson is a spiritual teacher of the Fourth Way, which is an ancient esoteric teaching of self-development brought to the West by G.I. Gurdjieff. Mr. Patterson is also an author, filmmaker, and speaker on spiritual themes, including The Fourth Way, Being and Becoming, Advaita Vedanta, Self-Awakening, Self-Observation, Esoteric Christianity, and Cosmic Body Breath Impressions, all of which mm-hmm. sound very interesting. Uh, he is also the founder and director of the Gurdjieff Legacy Foundation, through which he teaches study groups as well as seminars, workshops, and talks on Fourth Way themes. Mr. Patterson has also founded and directs the Gurdjieff Studies Program, which allows students living out of the reach of ongoing Gurdjieff Legacy Foundation groups to participate in study through correspondence seminars and scheduled private meetings. He has written nine books, the latest of which is Georgi Ivanovich Gurdjieff, The Man Teaching His Mission. And for today only, that is this Sunday, uh, 7th of September only, um, Mr. Patterson has offered a 10% discount on the retail price of his latest book if you purchase it from his website, which is gurdjiefflegacy.org. So you may have noticed those who are paying uh, close attention, I said we will be hopefully talking to Mr. Patterson today because um, uh, we are currently trying to get him on the line. Um, So it remains to be seen whether we actually speak to him or not. But um, in the meantime... uh, do any of our guests here today have anything um, insightful well, to say about the topic that we're discussing? Um, Mr. Patterson's latest book um, is Georgi Ivanovich Gurdjieff. Joe read it out earlier. The Man, the Teaching, His Mission. It is a, wow, it's a comprehensive tome. It is a serious book. I think of all the books, this one he's, he put 10 years, he says, of research into. He had written a lot on Gurdjieff beforehand. Um, and this one is probably his magnum opus. We'll get him to confirm that himself. Uh, I know Harrison, you've read it. Yes, I have. And what do you think? Well, I quite enjoyed it. It's structured in such a way that it takes you from basically Gurdjieff's birth until his death, and it's completely chronological. It's not necessarily a traditional biography. It takes you through events, uh, anecdotes, little stories um, called from all the sources on Gurdjieff, so uh, books written by his students um, and by um, just outside observers who had a glimpse into the, you know, this world of Gurdjieff and his work. And so it, it follows Gurdjieff's teaching, uh, the things he did uh, day by day, the, the phases of his life, and also the lives of some of his major students, uh, like Alfred Orage and P.D. Uspensky, and J.G. Bennett. Uh, So it follows them, their students, and how all the stories intertwine. So it's quite Um, in-depth. It has a similar structure as several of his other books. Um, For our our readers who may have read some of his stuff, he's written Struggle of the Magicians, um, Ladies of the Rope. Yeah, I read that one. Great book. Yeah, yeah, and those are kind of structured in a similar way with uh, little anecdotes from in chronological order, just showing the interaction between these people and uh, the things that they did. And so there's some there's some great stories in there. Some things that I hadn't heard of, but I hadn't read before. Um, 
I have, you know, uh, it's it's very difficult to read all the material in Gurdjieff. There are just hundreds of books. So I think he did that. Uh, Mr. Patterson did a, a great service by writing this book and putting all of these um, just little tidbits together to create this overarching narrative that shows, you know, Gurdjieff's life. Yeah, I love how there's interspersed. You've got um, a kind of a chronology of world historical events going on at the time. Absolutely. Not necessarily directly related to what Gurdjieff was doing, but Mr. Patterson sort of lets you know, okay, this was going on at this time when this happened. And it's very interesting, especially as um, we're looking back at recently, we've been talking a lot about the Russian Revolution, that period of time when there was great change in Russia. Of course, Gurdjieff's work began in that fire of revolutionary activity and uh, his story about how he eventually got to France and then set up in the U.S. And even in France, uh, then he went through the, the Nazi occupation. Yeah, okay, we have uh, Mr. Patterson on the line now, so we're going to go ahead and... Um... Hello. Hi, Mr. Patterson. How are you today? Pretty good, how are you? <laughs> Wondering if we're going to make it here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We, are, we? we usually have we usually have a few glitches, you know, but um, we get uh, there in the end. Okay. Um, so we're actually we're we're live right now because we you know the show is a scheduled start time. Um, uh -huh. We've we've done a we did a quick kind of bio intro with with the standard kind of stuff, you know, uh, for uh -huh. you. And um, it's just it's myself, Joe, Laura, Neil. And Harrison uh, on the kind of uh, on the mics here. Uh, we're just you know we're all kind of um, interested in the topic, and um, so we're just going to be putting some questions your way if uh, if that's okay with you. Okay, so there's there's more than two then. Yeah, there's four of us. We have these people. Oh my! Who tend to <laughs> hangers on, hangers on, you know. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. But all it right. keeps it keeps it a bit more interesting, I suppose. Different perspectives and different. Uh, uh -huh different ideas, you know. Um, anyway, I just want to, I suppose I should, first of all, thank you for uh, being on the show. Uh, we, we, all of us really appreciate the kind of uh, work you've done uh, in bringing uh, the life and times and teachings of Gurdjieff, uh, you know, uh, to the world, I suppose, in a large, in a large sense, because uh, you're one of the, uh, one of the main kind of uh, authors of, uh, of, of Gurdjieff works and, and, and books on the life of Gurdjieff. Um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit. I mean, uh, it's in your bio, I suppose, somewhere on the web. But uh, how you actually uh, got involved in, in in the Gurdjieff work and uh, what your history is, I suppose, in that sense. Mm hmm. Well, it happened in uh, 1963. I went to a bookstore in Manhattan, New York City, and uh, I'm looking at all the books. And I feel like I've read them all just by looking at the covers or the titles. Uh, I hadn't been drinking. I didn't smoke pot. It just happened. And uh, I stood there for I don't know how long. Finally, the manager came up and said, well, what are you looking for? And I said, I don't know. Uh, everything here I've already read. Of course, there's probably 20,000 titles. And he looked at me like I was a little screwy. <laughs> and he said, oh, you want something seminal? And I said, yes, that was the word. So uh, he gave me Meetings with Remarkable Men. I went back. I read it. Uh, that was uh, Friday evening. I went back on Monday morning after, uh, I should say, Monday after work. And the bookstore was closed. There was nobody there. Uh, it was the strangest book I'd ever read because the author is telling you something but hiding something at the same time. So it just leaves you with a question. And uh, so at that time, I tried to find people uh, in the Gurdjieff work. Anybody I met was interesting. I would uh, ask them. Nobody knew about the Gurdjieff work then. And uh, then... Uh, in 1969, I read uh, In Search of the Miraculous and uh, still looked. And, and this was an amazing book. Um, I was a major in uh, philosophy, psychology, English in college. 
and uh, every philosopher was wonderful to read, but it was like a chess match. Uh, the next philosopher made another move, and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. So I realized it wasn't in philosophy and in psychology. Um, the teacher said, uh, "All things being equal, this will happen." And I raised my hand and I said, "Well, when are all things equal?" He said, "Never." <laughs> <laughs> So I walked out. I was it for psychology. I got my degree, but that was I was no longer interested. And uh, then in uh, I had had a magazine in New York called In New York. I sold it to a company who then went bankrupt. And uh, so I was out of a job. I was another creditor, and uh, I was just um, dumbfounded. Uh, I went to a uh, every morning. I would go and pick up the New York Times, and I overheard uh, a man who turned out to be Peter Riley, who wrote New Gods in America. And I said to him, "Have you ever heard of the Gurdjieff work?" And he said, "Yes, uh, I just spoke to the leader of the Gurdjieff work yesterday." And uh, so I said, "Could I speak to him?" So he said, "Well, I have to give you a call." So he did, and. Uh, I called Lord Pentland, and uh, he said to me, uh, what do you want? And it just stopped me totally. I mean, I'd been looking all these years. Um, what did I want? And uh, he said, well, uh, you could see me this afternoon, or maybe Monday would be a better time. And having looked all those uh, years, I said, no, I want to see you now. So I went down, and we talked, and... Uh, he told me about uh, a little bit about Gurdjieff and uh, the work, and he had groups. And I wasn't very interested in joining a group. Uh, so uh, I went home, and I thought, well, this self-remembering uh, sounds pretty easy to do. Uh, I don't need a group to do it. And, uh, so I did what Spinsky says about dividing uh, the attention and experiencing the feeling of the body, what have you. And it was in the wintertime. I walked to the door, and I felt the coldness of uh, the the brass handle. I had lived there now three or four months, and I had never experienced that. Well, it wasn't a eureka moment, but I was still puzzled that never had I recognized that. And I went down the steps, and the steps creaked, and I'd never heard them creak. And uh, I got outside, and there was a seat coming down the street. And I wondered whether he carried a knife or not. Uh, The next thing I know, uh, I've mechanically gone down and bought the paper and talked to some people, paid for the paper, and come back. And I'm sitting down on a chair, and suddenly uh, I realize I've been asleep all this time. And I realized uh, when I went back and looked at it, what had happened... I'd been thinking about going to India. And so when I saw the Sikh, uh, I went into a a long association about India and what have you. And uh, so I realized I couldn't do this myself. So I called Lord Pentland, and uh, there it began. I see. Well, um, you've touched on a couple of things here. Um. This realization that you were asleep. I mean, if there's one thing that uh, is really powerful behind Gurdjieff's basic teachings is that he's telling you Spensky in that eventually went into his book, The Search of the Miraculous, that you are asleep. And Uspensky and, of course, anyone who's hearing this would tend to reject this outright. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, and and, and they should. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, this because is you have you to tell- verify it. Don't don't accept anything. That's mm-hmm. well, one me, of the me, great parts of the Gurdjieff tell- work. Let me tell you really quick what happened. Uh, I I'd spent many years uh, studying esoteric topics, psychology, biology, etc. And I uh, I was bedridden at one point after having my third child and I had this copy of uh, 
in search of the miraculous that I had picked up on a sale table in a bookstore. And it was probably one of the only books around me that I hadn't read. And being bedridden, I thought, well, okay, I'm I'm forced to be in bed, so I'll read this book. And I have to tell you that it it made me so angry. Um, and I I tell I tell people the story about you know how I would read and and then he would say something, and I would throw the book across the room against the wall, and then I would fume. I would just be so angry, and I would fume about it. And then after a while, I'd start thinking, well, you know, uh, yeah, uh, he's probably right. And then I would get one of the kids to pick it up and bring it back to me. And I would start reading again, and I think I think I must have thrown it against the wall about four or five times before I gave up throwing it against the wall. And I still have that copy held together with duct tape. You know? <laughs> so that was that was back in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of one of the things I find uh, fascinating, and also fascinating in in the context of um, something that Gurdjieff has <coughs> has said is that a lot of the things that he talked about in, in the ways that he talked about them, about man being asleep and man being a machine, human beings being machines, essentially, unconscious, is that a lot of this is being, uh, a lot of these these ideas are, are being pretty much proven uh, with kind of cutting-edge cognitive psychology. I don't know if you're aware of the, the there's different books out there um, called Thinking Fast and Slow and Strangers to Ourselves, but they basically talk about uh, that there being two kind of systems uh, at a psychological or uh, neurological level within uh, within human beings, and um, that there's a, a system behind uh, the a system behind the, uh, the 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 kind of conscious uh, awareness that that drives motivations, and that we're sen- essentially unconscious of it. You know, so uh, I in reading those books, I've, I thought it was very interesting that. Um, that a lot of the factor details in that from uh, from a scientific point of view are bearing out what uh, Gurdjieff said, you know, fifty, sixty, seventy, yeah, eighty years ago. Yeah, modern science is you know? just proving proving everything he said was correct. That he was like, you know, light years ahead of everybody else. But I want to ask you this: Now, I read Struggle of the Magicians, and it was some time ago. I guess probably not long after it came out. And my husband read it. We both enjoyed it very much. It's a tremendous book. Uh, I haven't read this new one yet. Harrison has read it, and Neil has read part of it, and I've read part of it. And of course, I looked at all the pictures. Um, but uh, this is this is a, a, a hefty book, and it's got like everything. And you took ten years to pull this together, right? Uh, yes, but I was I was writing other books at the time and uh, doing other things. Uh huh. So was there anything about this that was particularly difficult? Did you have to do any travels or interview people to to, to write this book? Well, we had gone to all the major archives over the years. Uh, That was part of it, uh, to to assemble this material. Um, That was the major thing to do. I had first written, uh, after Eating the Eye, which was the first book, I wrote uh, Struggle with Magicians, and uh, that was essentially the template for the book that you're talking about now, uh, The Man the Teaching uh, His Mission. Uh-huh. So uh, it was uh, studying the work, practicing the work, and going to archives, uh, occasionally talking to people, uh, what you do in, in producing a book. Right. Was there any part of it that was particularly difficult? Uh, the end. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, well. we, we had to make it to uh, the printers, and uh, all sorts of things suddenly were happening uh, uh, that had never happened in any of the other eight books. And uh, people were making mistakes they had never made before. It was like there was something that didn't want this book to be published. And uh, finally, when I sent it off, I thought I had I, – I came down with eye allergies, all sorts of stuff with the, with the stress of putting this out. I thought I had asthma, uh, but I didn't have asthma. I had a 90% blockage in one artery, 
And uh, so when we sent the book off, uh, it wasn't too long after that, uh, I went to the hospital and had a two-stent surgery. And, you know, you never know whether you're going to survive anything. Uh, right. Um, so my only wish was that uh, if I was going to die, I would hope that I would live long enough to see the book. And uh, so I've seen the book, and I'm still here, and it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me ask you. You call it the man, the teaching, his mission. Right. Uh, I would like to approach this just from the you know from the back end of it. There, what was in your words, based on everything you've uh, read, studied, learned, heard, what was Gurdjieff's mission? Can you tell us? Tell the audience. Well, he said uh, that unless the wisdom of the East and the energy of the West could be harnessed and used harmoniously, the world would be destroyed. Uh, the world uh, is functionally awake, but it, there's not real awareness. And because of that, uh, we are uh, very suggestible. And because of that, there is a periodic need for the destruction of other people. Uh, which is why we see war after war after war. And as Einstein said, if there is a third world war, the fourth world war will be fought with sticks and stones. So Gurdjieff felt that he had to give a major shock to the West and bring this ancient, esoteric, sacred teaching he had discovered uh, and reformulated uh, to the West and decided... Uh, the entryway would be uh, Russia, and he started there in 1912. Okay. So that's his mission. Now let's go to the next one, the teaching. Can you synopsize for our audience um, the teaching uh, and how he went about doing it? Well, the teaching fundamentally is that we are asleep, we have no will. We can't really do. But we are functionally awake, and some people are very uh, highly functionally awake. Um, we basically are living out of one of three centers, the instinctual, sexual, the emotional, or the mental. And in this culture, being so mental, uh, most people are living out of the mental in one sense or another. Not the deep mind, but the formatory mind the mind that if people uh, listen to themselves, they'll see you're always talking to yourself about what? About yourself, because we are all coded with self-love and vanity. Everything is a reference to myself, uh, even if I'm doing, quote-unquote, good works and what have you. So it's to become aware of myself, and that's the question. How do I become aware of myself if I'm asleep? And uh, so the chief practice is self-remembering. And in self-remembering, uh, then there's self-observation. You observe what? You observe the eye of the moment, what you're thinking, feeling, the impulses, what have you. And you will be uh, easy, you'll easily be able to uh, see, verify that you're not one eye but many eyes. So the, uh, over a course of time, because there will be resistance, this idea will suddenly come to your emotional center that you are not one eye, but you are many eyes, that you're not an individual, uh, and you're not really in awareness, uh, and so forth and so on. And here's a teaching that can bring you through the various psychological, physical patterns to a real I. And uh, I might read something uh, here from, uh, let's see, it's Fritz Peters, Boyhood with Gurdjieff. Uh, he says, uh, the philosophies, religions, and other movements had all failed to accomplish this aim of waking people up. And the only possible way to accomplish it was through the individual development of man. As an individual developed his own unknown potentialities, and by the way, when he says man, he means men and women. Man is the active source. Right. Uh, 
as an individual developed his own unknown potentialities, he would become strong and would in turn influence many more people. If enough individuals could develop themselves, even partially, into genuine natural men, able to use the real potentialities that were proper to mankind, each such individual will then be able to convince and win over as many as a hundred other men, who would, each in his turn, upon achieving development, be able to influence another hundred or so. Uh, Gurdjieff added, rather grimly, that he was in no sense joking when he had said that time was short. Further, he said that history had already proven to us that such tools as politics, religion, and any other organized movement which treated man in the mass, quote-unquote, and not as individual beings, were failures, that they would always be failures, and that separate, distinct growth of each individual in the world was the only possible solution. Wow. And that's, uh, okay, let me back up to one thing you just said a minute ago, and then I want to come back to what uh, Peter said. You said that it finally comes into your emotional center. Your emotional center becomes aware that you really aren't awake. You know, that this is like an emotional. uh, It seems to me that that awareness, if you really achieve that, should scare the hell out of you. I mean, it should should be terrifying. That's why you have to be in a teaching. Uh, yeah. If you don't, uh, yes, you'll be terrified. And you won't go to excess in one sense or another. Uh, you, yeah. and you see that people doing that all the time with drugs, drink, and so forth. So you you have you can't wake yourself up. You have to be with a teacher. Of course not. Uh, and uh, he or she will uh, be there to uh, give you Talk the you. support and trust you need to go beyond that. Because... Uh, deeply, if you ask the student, what is it that knows that you are now multiple eyes? And he or she won't know, of course. But the answer is uh, that which we all are and always are, developed or undeveloped consciousness. The real eye. Yeah. Yeah, because something has to know that. Something has to be aware of that. Because right. uh, and, and when that awareness comes, it's uh, it's it's horrifying. I mean, it 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 can lay you flat on your back. You know, you can <laughs> you can sit there in a state of abject terror for days on end. Uh, True, the other thing, it, it interested me. I, I I didn't react in that way. I thought, wow, this is incredible. That I did. I could have all these eyes, right, and think that I have was an individual all this time. And having recognized uh, the variations in uh, my eyes, uh, I began to look at other people as, as I had never looked at them before. Uh-huh. And, uh, and life became even more interesting. Well, getting back to this destruction problem, and obviously Gurdjieff was very concerned about this, concerned enough that he put himself at great risk on many occasions. He lived through a lot of discomfort. He sacrificed an enormous amount, you know, in many ways to do what he was doing because he really, really had this mission. And here Fritz Peters mentions it also, that the world will be destroyed. And then you mentioned Einstein's comment about... uh, if there was a third world war, that the fourth world war would be fought with sticks and stones. So yeah, you... Excuse me a moment. What, what I was reading was what Fritz Peters wrote about what Gurdjieff said. Right. Uh, Fritz Peters exactly. didn't say that. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. That I was, I was referring to it as having been written by Fritz Peters uh, rather than... Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the thing is, is that if... Uh, do you see this... Uh, imminent destruction before us now? Uh, Well, (laughs) who can see into the future, really? But it certainly doesn't look good. Uh, But the question for each individual, um, I mean, whether there's a large war or not, there's nothing I can do about it. As Aspinsky said, they're big creatures. What I can do is work on myself to become more and more 
available for higher energies and to develop a uh, Keshtan body, uh, or some people call it an astral body, but it's a little more than that, right. and eventually a soul. So whether the uh, world will end uh, with us fighting with sticks or stones or not, I can't tell and I can't influence, but I an- can influence my world and uh, develop myself no matter what is happening. And I think that should be the uh, basis for everyone. And in doing that, you receive higher and higher energies and transmit them. And if enough people uh, come to doing that, it will certainly have an influence, whether it has an influence large enough to advert uh, our suggestibility for reciprocal destruction. I don't know. I hope so. Kurjev says, uh, I might say, in uh, all and everything, uh, when he he talks about the terror of the situation, and he says, uh, if this uh, property, this need to periodically destroy each other's existence, uh, is to disappear, then it will be with time alone, and uh, time is a capital T, thanks either to the guidance of a certain being with very high reason, or to certain exceptional cosmic events. Uh, he says no more than that, but um, that perhaps is a uh, reason for not rejoicing, but uh, praying and hoping. Yes, indeed. Well, what, do you, what do you think he meant by certain cosmic events? Do you have I have any... no idea. <laughs> no idea, okay. Just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Let's go to the first item on your list, which is, I'm working backwards here, the man. Uh, If you could describe Gurdjieff as you're, you know, as you've received the impressions of him through interacting with people who knew him, reading his writings, um, uh, or hearing stories about him, what kind of a man was he, in your estimation? Well, we have to begin at the beginning, I think. Uh, it occurs in Meetings with the Remarkable Men, the second series of books of his legomanism, where he is on artillery range uh, because of a, a rivalry, a love rivalry with another uh, young man. And they decide that God will decide who will have the woman. They go out into the artillery range. And um, uh, the uh, shells start falling, and uh, they both pull through. But Gurdjieff has come to, as he says, the complete sensation of himself, right? The complete sensation. Uh, We all have sensations, but complete sensation. And then, uh, having come to that realization, he looks around and he sees the suffering and misery of human beings, And so he comes to the question, uh, what is the sense of significance of life on earth and human life in particular? And this is a question that drives his uh, whole life uh, because to understand this then uh, brings him to, uh, well, first it brings him to Ani, which is about 30 miles away from where he lives. And uh, he and uh, another person find in an underground passage a parchment um, from the Sarmung Brotherhood, speaking about some very interesting ideas. He had studied the uh, religion and the science of his day, but he found no adequate answer to his question. But he felt then the ancient uh, wisdom societies might have the answer. And so... um, This was down around uh, Iraq, where Iraq is today. And on the way down there, uh, he stopped in uh, to visit uh, a priest who showed him a map of pre-sand Egypt. He doesn't say what he saw on the map, but we know what he did. uh, Pre-sand Egypt means uh, uh, Egypt before 4000 uh, B.C. Uh, he immediately goes to uh, the Giza Plateau, uh, and there he becomes a guide. 
And why does he go there? Uh, I believe he went there because on the map he saw the Sphinx. The Sphinx is 2700 B.C., according to most people. But here it was, I believe, or something, on the map, and that took him to uh, Egypt. And there uh, he becomes initiated four times into the ancient uh, Egyptian mysteries. Uh, Not the Egypt religion we know today, uh, which focuses on animals and so forth and so on, but a science of being, which was the original Egyptian religion. Over time, he recognizes that elements of the teaching have uh, gone uh, northward. So he makes a second uh, trip now to discover uh, the elements of the teaching that are missing. He finds those uh, going to uh, Tibet um, and uh, the Hindu Kush and so forth and so on. And uh, he puts it together now in a teaching that is uh, modeled for the West, and he brings it uh, to Russia, as I say, in 1912. Um, And um, before doing that, I might say in 1911, he took a 21-year vow to live an artificial life. Uh, In other words, to be a teacher of other people. Uh, Anytime you uh, adopt an identity, Uh, you can easily become identified with it and become the teacher or the president or whatever you are. And so you lose yourself. You you fall asleep in being a teacher or a president, what have you. So um, he uh, adopted an artificial role of a teacher and brought it to the West. Um, I might say it's rather interesting um, that... uh, what I said before about um, his question about uh, the sense and significance of life on Earth and human life in particular, he came to realize that we are part of the organic life on Earth, like the flora and fauna and what have you. Right. Our only difference is that um, we are three-centered beings, not two-centered or one. And everybody is doing just as great nature wishes us to do just by being alive, moving around and breathing. We don't have to do anything else. Um, But we do have the potentiality, because as he says, we are images of God, to develop ourselves. Uh, And this is the teaching that he brought. Um, Before that, he had gone to several monasteries, He had become a hypnotic healer for four or five years. Then he uh, became a quote-unquote professor, instructor, instructor of supernatural sciences. And uh, he said, these atomized people who have not opened themselves to themselves, but have contented themselves with other people's fantasies, forming from them illusory conceptions and at the same time, limiting themselves to a point of engagingly upon, engaging upon authoritative discussions of all kinds of seemingly scientific, but for the most part, abstract themes. Uh, I'm looking at the Herald of uh, Coming Good he, uh-huh. here. And he says, there are people who give themselves up to quasi-human knowledge, occultism, theosophy, spiritualism. He later added psychoanalysis. And he said that... Um, He became an expert and guide in evoking phenomena of the beyond, uh, holding workshops for the perfection of uh, these automatized psychological people. Um, So that was where he came from. And uh, he, of course, uh, started the Institute uh, for the Harmonious Development of Man in uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. The Russian Revolution drove him to Tiflis. Tiflis didn't work out, went to Constantinople, um, and then was drawn to Germany, England, and finally opened up his institute in uh, France in uh, 1922. Had a uh, serious automobile accident in July 24 after returning from America, tremendously successful trip, and um, 
Then uh, he closed the institute and decided he would hurl the teaching in the future by uh, writing a legomenism uh, all on everything. And um, I might say in terms of um, who he is, uh, when I read in 1963, um, search, or, um, Meetings with Remarkable Men, it says at the, be- uh, at the beginning, according to traditional conceptions, the function of a master is not limited to the teaching of doctrines, but implies an actual incarnation of knowledge, thanks to which he can awaken other men and help them in their search simply by his presence. He is there to create conditions for an experience through which knowledge can be lived as fully as possible. This is the real key to the life of Gurdjieff. He is a master. Well, I've got a question relating to that. Um, The story of of him in the the, uh, artillery field and coming to the full sensation of himself. And it it seems to me um, from, from his reaction to that and even through reading about how he interacted with people, that he had a, uh, not only a deep curiosity about humans as like, almost like lab rats and studying them, but also a deep compassion. And, but at the same time, um, reading, with, uh, reading about how he interacted with people in general and, and his students in particular, um, some of his methods seemed almost cruel. And uh, I was wondering if you could comment a bit about that and how Gurdjieff actually taught in life with his students. <coughs> Well, first of all, he he would not uh, like the word curiosity <laughs> because it's very mental. <laughs> um, how do you how do you wake somebody up from where they are and where they believe they are and uh, are are defending at all costs? Uh, it can be a very slow way uh, through uh, Zen meditation, perhaps. Uh, I've done a little of that, but not very much. His way was. <clears throat> to um, give you the practices of self-love or self, <laughs> self-remembering uh, and uh, self-observation so that the, um, these are the guiding uh, principles of life that then people are trying to be there when they're with him. And then in one way or another, he will show them uh, where they are identified. And at the same time, he's got this amazing presence and love, uh, but he's pushing your buttons so uh-huh. that you are caught in between. You, don't, you, you love him, you hate him. <laughs> and what, what could you uh, come to through that? Well, you try to work it out. Uh, loving, hating, whatever. What is he a master? Blah, 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 blah. Well, as I said before, what knows that you hate him at the moment? What knows you love him at the moment? That's what we all are, and that's where we're going, and that's what he's pointing to for everyone. I think my favorite story is the one where he was uh, recovering from his injuries, and he was in the being cared for by some local tribes tribes people or shepherds or whatever and he uh could hear the gunfire in the distance and he would get a go down and dip himself in this icy cold water and had this marvelous awakening uh you know I, I don't remember all the exact details of it but that that story has stuck in my mind forever that's in the uh, third series uh-huh Life is real only then when I am. I think he was shot. Was he shot twice and severely Three times. wounded? Three times. Three, Three times. Yeah, by uh, and accidentally. Straight bullets. <laughs> straight bullets. Yeah. Do you think his stories about, uh, you know, where he went and what he did and how he got his information are uh, all exactly according to you know, what really happened, shall we say, or were they, in a in a sense, veiled or metaphoric, or um, do, you, do you think it all really happened the way he described it, or did he have a different intention in telling the stories? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I think he's very clear about what happened, uh, <clears throat> him going to Egypt, uh, being initiated four times, 
um, going to Tibet, um, yeah. the, Sar- the Sarmong Monastery uh, there, the Sarmong, was uh, a monastery uh, that uh, Shogyam Trungpa Rinpoche uh, represented. And um, he certainly uh, picked up some of the elements that had come from ancient Egypt there. And then in the um, um, uh, Hindu Kush and other places, uh, he was gathering this material um, and putting it together into this teaching. And, uh, Has anybody f- ever followed in his footsteps and gone to the various places and uh, basically kind of recreated the the travels? Not that I know of. To uh, some degree, uh, Oscar, uh, what's his name? Um, the psychology fellow. What's his name? Hichazo. Mm-hmm. Uh, he German. said he went. He, he went to the uh, Asia. And then went to this uh, Hindu Kush and what have you. Whether he did or not, I don't know. Yeah. Because I, I just think it would be a fascinating thing. Because, you know, one of the things that I discovered, <clears throat> interestingly, uh, doing some uh, in-depth research into uh, some of the ancient uh, philosophies and ancient history, because I'm a historian, um, was that there are some really powerful similarities between uh, the Stoic philosophy and some of the teachings of Gurdjieff. And it, That's uh, right. And it kind of strikes me as astonishing and amazing and wonderful that there could have been such a tradition that was preserved and handed down, uh, you know, which to me validates that he must have gotten these teachings from somewhere because when you look into the the teachings of the Stoics, you find these key words, these elements, these uh, these phrases, these ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you go further than if you go further go than that, uh, you'll go to Pythagoras. Oh, and absolutely. And if you go further than that, Pythagoras spent 22 years in Egypt. He brought the uh, Egyptian teaching uh, as it was. Uh, to Italy, and uh, then to Greece, and then into the Middle East. Um, well, even even before Pythagoras, there was Orpheus. Mm-hmm. And right. So yeah, so it's uh, it's all tied in together, and it's all this. Uh, I mean, Walter Burkert considers that uh, Pythagoras and Orpheus were shamanistic type individuals of the Central Asian variety. Oh. Huh. Well, they started in Egypt. <laughs> That's all I can say. <clears throat> but how did it get to Egypt? <laughs> or uh, from well, Egypt if, or whatever. If you, you know. if you read uh, the first series, right. uh, Gurdjieff speaks about Atlantis and um, the uh, wise people of Atlantis understood that Atlantis would sink. And um, so they went to Egypt, and um, they brought their uh, teaching with them, and they gave that to the Egyptians of their time, and that created the Egyptian religion. Which reminds me, you mentioned a while ago about this pre-Sand Egypt map, right? Right. That it was before uh, before the change of climate that turned Egypt, or large parts of Egypt, into a desert. And the issue of the uh, of the Sphinx, and then, you know, the currently accepted dating of the Sphinx, well, if the this, if this Sphinx was on this map, which we don't know because we don't know what was on the map, but if it was, and if it was pre-sand Egypt, then it was older than, you know, 2,600 years, or 2,600 years. Of yeah, course. So that's so that you know, and that's been validated also in recent years by Robert Schock, who did this did the geological study showing that the uh, the Sphinx was weathered by rain, uh, that's by right, thousands of years of rain. Right. So, so Gurdjieff was Gurdjieff was an astonishing man. I mean, an astonishing man, absolutely astonishing. Let me st- stop you here with this. A lot of people 
believe that the teaching is rooted in Sufism and comes from um, someplace in the uh, Hindu Kush, what have you. Uh, J.G. Bennett, who was a, a pupil of Gurdjieff's, who spoke Turkish in many languages and what have you, uh, is a chief proponent of that idea. But if you uh, read uh, In Search of the Miraculous, um, Gurdjieff is asked, uh, what is the origin of the fourth way? And he says, and this is in uh, Ital, uh, Ital in the book, Esoteric Christianity, right? Exactly. And then if you look at the uh, last pages or last chapter or so of search, Aspinsky has Gurdjieff saying uh, uh, that Christianity was known before Christ. It exactly. was known in Egypt, but not the Egypt we know about, right, through history and what mm. have you. And so this is the origin. I think it's so plain, but people seem to uh, want to deny it. that. Uh, and that's a, and there's another <laughs> another stoic connection because if you read uh Diogenes Laertius uh biographies of the various philosophers and his uh citations of their uh different sayings you find that there are sayings in there that later ended up in the New Testament being assigned to quote Jesus unquote mm-hmm. so right. it's I mean, I don't know if we'd ever be able to untangle it. I've been working on it for 40 years, but it's it's uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And now I would like to shift gears just a little bit. Um, Gurdjieff talks about the various worlds, you know, the uh, the levels of reality, if we want to call them that. You mean you mean cosmoses? You're right. And my husband is a is a physicist and a specialist in hyper, hyperdimensional physics, and even wrote a book about it. He must be really out there, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. But in any event, he was he was working on this uh, many years ago, and I'd say it was in uh, let's see, 1966. What year did you? Uh, what year did you find that book? Uh, 63. Okay, so you were into it in 63. And I have this thing that I had written down. And let me read it to you. And I want you to give me a reaction to it. So what I had written was, Now, a curious thing about the teachings of Gurdjieff is that he claims that man is food for something other. But there is a lack of really specific information about this other. We have often speculated, and I mean myself and my husband, as to whether Gurdjieff knew about hyperdimensional realities and just simply could not bring himself to tell anyone. Or if he did tell some of his students, was this something that only those on the inside knew and held back? My husband met with Henry Trackhole in Marseille in July of 1986. It was a brief meeting in an airport restaurant. No, not 1986. Yeah, 1986. Yeah. Lasting about two hours. (laughs) That's going backwards. (laughs) But you could do that too, couldn't you? (laughs) Yeah. So his interest, my husband's interest, was in determining if joining with such a school as the Gurdjieff Foundation in Paris would be helpful to his own awakening. He asked many questions, most particularly relating to this idea of, quote, being eaten, unquote, by something. Uh-huh. His his assessment, and let me say my husband's assessments are pretty highly developed because he's been a scientist for many years and, and, a, and a professor. His assessment of Mr. Treckle's reaction to this question was that the man was very uncomfortable about answering As he recalls it, Mr. Treckle glanced about nervously as though he might be overheard, although there was clearly no one to overhear, and made a somewhat vague allusion to interdimensional beings. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he wrote in his journal, and that, that is still preserved after this meeting, and this is my husband writing, 
I am an energy transformer and converter. That is the essence of my existence. That is my only possible goal. I can choose to serve this goal or not. I can serve only as an energy transformer, so it seems to not make much difference what I do. The result will be the same. Or I can serve as a channel. This is the choice between self-will and discipline. What I, and that's in quotes, do, that is, I, personality, is self-will. What acts through me is not self-will. Thus, I wish to allow that which can act through me that is not self-will. For this end, I need to eliminate self-will, but God forbid not to eliminate control. So I wish to eliminate self-will. I wish to eliminate identification. Eliminating identification is most important. I wish to self-remember. I wish to plan to account for each and every hour. I wish to get rid of my hump to cease being a camel. How? Through elimination of identification. And then he wrote some more, but basically this this was the result of his conversation with Trekle about uh, inquiring about hyperdimensional beings. So what do you think about hyperdimensional aspects of Gurdjieff's cosmoses? Do you think that that is that his term, terminology was just different and that we can look at this mathematically that way? Well, if uh, you look at the diagram of every living thing, you'll see that above man are angels and archangels. Right? Right. Right. So wouldn't they be interdimensional beings? I would say so. I would definitely say so. But I take it that your husband didn't go into the work then. Well, why not? <clears throat> because he was a director at the university, and he really couldn't give up his job. <laughs> but we have well, been involved. I mean, We've been involved with it with a with a small group with ourselves uh, together and with others for many many years. Um, uh, but, in other words, you were teaching yourself then. <clears throat> well, not exactly. We had, like I said, we have a small group. And, but, uh, but who is teaching you then, if if you're not? Gurdjieff is. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> we, <laughs> we through his writings, we you're, are. You're, you're channeling Gurdjieff. <laughs> yeah, more or less. <laughs> oh, that's silly. Heavenly days. No, that's silly. Well, why not? I mean, he he says he he is immortal within the solar system. Well, and so I, he I is an interdimensional being. Yes, I dream about him. And uh, I, I had one dream one night where he came and, and, you know, I have these dreams where, you know, it's like I actually get voices and everything. And I dreamed about him and I was puzzling over a problem for a particular individual for quite some time. And he came and he said to me, he said, you know, that person has been tortured. You know, that is nothing but torture. And you have to understand this. And they have been tortured into having all of these uh, different eyes that, Mm -hmm. you know, in other words, it was as a result of this torture. And so, you know, I mean, it's it's like whenever I have a problem, Gurdjieff comes to me in dreams. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. Uh, That's that's so silly. I know it. Well, it's not so silly. I mean, he's had that kind of impact. On people who have met him, why not? Let, why not have that kind of impact? Well, clearly, he has had that kind of impact on people who have met him decades after through books like Williams, oh, like yeah. Spensky's, and so I on. I read every word. I mean, I just, I just eat it up. You see, books can only take you so far. I know. Uh, yeah. They're a uh, B influence at best, and if they are B, they'll soon become A. Um, Gurdjieff brought a teaching, and uh, to enter in it, to, into it is to enter into a kind of moral suffering because you recognize you aren't uh, what you thought you were, and all yes. your goals and ideals and everything else are put in question. And uh, so, in living through that, uh, working with self remembering, self observation, uh, something develops in you. And eventually, uh, out of this uh, suffering, 
and striving will come an inner separation uh, between what you take to be yourself and what you are. And out of that, a Keshtan body will begin to develop and um, the physical will appear in the Keshtan, uh, mm. not the other way around. So when you're remembering yourself, you're remembering from the Keshdin and not the physical, and uh, you're being developed. Well, um, maybe that's what's if, happened over these years. I don't know. It's We've worked very, very hard. And, uh, and actually, this radio show is one of the results of that work. You know, we, oh, okay. Uh, we spend a lot of time. But of course, like I said, my my particular area is history and and uh, research and so forth. Trying to find all the pieces to fit together to uh, basically put the picture together. I mean, it's like didn't Gurdjieff at one point say that you know learning history is is part of knowing who you are? That you- I I don't recall that quote at all. But- I'm just wondering, as you're talking, I can see you're very sincere in what you're saying, but isn't this just another I that is putting off really getting into the work? You want to know the history about it, but not the actual experiencing of it. Oh, I've <laughs> that that may be so. That may be so. But at my age, uh, it's a little you're, late. <laughs> okay, I, I am 77. How old are you, young, young lady? I'm 63. Oh, my. <laughs> I would love to be 63 <laughs> and start. You're a young one still, Laura. Uh, uh, uh. Um, William Gurdjieff was actually in the news recently, just in passing. Um, I, I came across this article about this city. You, you've already mentioned it, the Ani. city of Ani. Ani. Right. Oh, yeah, that was terrific. It was, it was, it was crazy. So it, basically, researchers today are still discovering new underground chambers, uh, cathedrals, tunnels, a whole... The city is growing, basically, underneath uh, this location where Gurdjieff... Said there was a city. Said there was a city. And the article just in passing mentions that this city of Ani, the lost underground city of Ani, was first discovered by G.I. Gurdjieff 135 years ago. And researchers today are still... And then it moves on, you know. Oh, just, yeah. I, I didn't know he was the first... I mean, he accidentally found it, so he says, right? Oh, oh definitely. And that set him yeah. off on his quest. Yeah, he lived there uh, for three or four weeks with a friend, Pagassian. Yes. And as I say, they, they found the parchment from the Sarmung Monastery. And uh, then he realized that the ancient wisdom societies could answer his question of the sense and significance of life on Earth and human life in particular. But but look at the answer he finally comes to, that from nature's perspective, uh, we're doing our duty just by living, uh, receiving energies, transmitting them, what have you. It doesn't matter whether you're driving a cab or you're a commander-in-chief or whatever you are, from nature's perspective. Uh, and when you die, you're going to die, uh, and that will be it unless you have developed yourself so to the degree that you have a Keshden body, which can survive death. So right. uh, that, that seems to me to be the aim for everyone, uh, unless you uh, don't mind becoming uh, fertilizer, as Gurdjieff says. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> well, this has just been uh, really... Yeah, um, it's been really, 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 really good to talk to you, Mr. Patterson. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and oh, thank share you. Your, some of your stories and insights. Yeah, I would, I'd just like to say as well that um, uh, Mr. Patterson's latest book um, is available today at a 10% discount. It's Georgi Ivanovich Gurdjieff, the man, the teaching, his mission. It's available from his website, which is gurdjieflegacy.org, and you can get it at a 10% discount uh, today, Sunday, today on, only. only. $10 uh, discount. Yeah. $10 discount, exactly. Yeah, so y'all get over there because this is probably <laughs> the, the definitive 
uh, compendium of of Gurdjieff. Yeah. And uh, I know that most of our listeners are going to be interested in in getting that because we get questions all the time, and I'm, you know, and 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 I tell them go read William Patrick Patterson's book. <laughs> Well, yeah. thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, William. Thank you All right. so much. And best it's of luck. It's been a great pleasure. Indeed. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Wow, he's 77. Still what a going. delightful, what a delightful person. Just absolutely delightful. Yeah. And just so full of of knowledge and and depth and insight. You know, he's right on top of everything. I mean, just... 11 books. If you go to his website, actually, he's got a few videos also available. Um, I think one he produced himself, similar kind of to his book, kind of Life and Times of Gurdjieff. He also gives some talks. Um, There's a very interesting video where he compares the teachings of Castaneda, Carlos Castaneda with Gurdjieff. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if he's responsible for the discovery, but he does touch on how the the similarities are clearly that Castaneda's Don Juan and the teaching there stem from what Gurdjieff was saying. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a, yeah. What's his name? Uh, Castaneda. He, he ripped off <laughs> Gurdjieff right and left. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, and Patterson clear-cut. also wrote a book about, I think it was called The Life and Teachings of Carlos Castaneda, but he goes through it all and has some pretty definitive links showing that uh, Castaneda was aware of Gurdjieff and Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. We 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 know it. Yeah. Yeah, because there's I think we even found at one point uh a, a connection where uh d- didn't we at one point find a connection where we knew that Castaneda was uh in the right place at the right time to have been aware or or I that he that, mentioned it or something. I thought that was in Patterson's book. But yeah, maybe it, it yeah, in maybe it was in Patterson's book, yeah. Because yeah. you know, that was uh, just pretty fascinating. Yeah. So. All right, folks, we're going to leave it there for this week. Um, thanks to uh, Mr. Patterson again, and thanks to all of our co-hosts and to our chatters and to our listeners. Uh, we'll be back next week with another show. Um until then, have a good one. Bye bye from everybody and all of us and everything. Have a great one. All and everything. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>